Okay. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session for Azure Networking for DBAs. Everything you need to know in 20 minutes, and I promise you nothing more. <laughs> so, um, myself and Chris, uh, we're from Coio. Uh, so we're a Microsoft Gold Partner, and we provide managed services and consulting uh, services for um, analytics, Power BI, uh, data, and a cloud platform. Um, and a little bit about us. Uh, so my name is Mark Dunbar, and I'm a senior cloud consultant. Uh, that essentially means uh, anything to do with Azure uh, networking, infrastructure, and security. Uh, and with me is Chris. Yep, I'm Chris. I started off as a DBA working for Coio about four and a half years ago. Uh, and I'm, oh. Okay, I can talk a bit louder, that's fine. Um, yeah, and I'm now an analytics consultant and have been for a couple of years now, so. Great, thanks very much. So, we don't have very long and networking is quite a big topic. So, <laughs> we're gonna get through this uh, as, uh, as simply as we can. So, a bit about our agenda today. We're gonna talk about virtual networks, what they are. We'll talk about network interface cards, virtual machines, IP addresses, network security groups, a bit on subnetting, and some takeaways. We've got a nice cheat sheet for you at the end. So, what are virtual networks? So, virtual networks are a private connection between your resources. Um, it doesn't matter whether we're, whether we're talking about Azure or on-prem. The premise for uh, private networking is all the same. Uh, so it's an inter-resource communication that's private between your resources. It's not over the internet. It is a private connection. <clears throat> it's trusted traffic, or at least hopefully it is. <laughs> hopefully you trust all the traffic within your own private virtual network. You have full control over the traffic, so you can uh, do filtering or segregation between different networks or traffic on that network. And then you can optionally connect this to other networks as well, whether that's peering within Azure or VPN back to on-prem. So in terms of the architecture diagrams, and if you look at the uh, Azure Architecture Center, this is the kind of thing that you would expect to see. We have the virtual networks here, and that's the symbol for virtual networks at the bottom left. And a virtual network has to contain at least one subnet, and a subnet would have network interface cards, and they can be connected to virtual machines, and then we can protect that, uh, that subnet or that network interface card with something called an NSG, a network security group. More on that in a little bit. So. What we've got there, network interface cards, and these are the actual Azure uh, icons that we see here. Um, virtual machines, a virtual machine must always have a NIC associated with it in Azure. A VM cannot just float around. It has to be connected to a network. Um, and we have a public IP addresses. So let's flip this around and convert these to something that perhaps we're a bit more familiar with in the real world. So let's say the virtual machine is a house. Network interface card are the doors of the house, so front door and back door. And the public IP address is the um, address of the front door of the house. So, it's Dungeons and Dragons theme, so we've gone all in here. <laughs> so let's introduce Wayne the Warrior. And he wants to host a Dungeons and Dragons party at his house. So, he tarts it all up, he's got his sign up there. Dungeons and Dragons party, and he's going to invite some guests over. So we've got some, some close friends. Let's say they live in the same street, could be a cul-de-sac. They are local, they are trusted, they have regular contact, and a key thing, they already know the route. And anybody familiar with network routing, that's quite important. So they already know how to get to Wayne the Warrior's house. And because of that, they can go into his house through the back door. They already know the way in, they're local. We also have guests. So they are not local, they are not trusted, but they are invited. And because of this, he needs some kind of directions, whether that's a map or, or sat nav, and that takes him to the address at the front of his house. So he goes to the front door and he knocks because it's polite and then he's allowed in to join the party. So. What if, because it's a party, this might always happen, what if we get some uninvited guests? What can we do about it? So, let's introduce our next character. We're gonna call him Norman the Doorman. 
he's our, <laughs> he's our NSG, our network security group. So Norman will stand guard at the front of the house, and uh, we're not allowing any dragons in. It's like that phrase, if you're not on the list, you're not getting in. So here's our next character. We're going to call him Dragon Den. Um, he has a bit of a hissy fit because he's, uh, he's not invited. He throws a tantrum, and Norman the doorman sends him on his way. But then we've got, we'll call him Merlin the Wizard. He's not a dragon. He's on the list. So he's allowed in. You can join the party and have a good time. So we can think about virtual networks as being, a, if you like, a gated community. Everybody within that community can talk to each other. They're all trusted. They're all friendly. Um, and the NSGs are, are the doorman on, on the house or the individual streets within that gated community, should we want to. <clears throat> so with NSGs, we can allow or deny traffic based on source and destination, IP addresses, um, a specific port, or a specific protocol. So protocol being TCP or UDP. But we won't go into the details uh, with that at the moment in this session. We can apply the NSGs to your network interface card directly, or subnet, or both. So again, think of the network interface card as being the doors on a house, and the subnet being a, a street within that gated community. We've got a list of common ports here. Um, we're going to have these on the final slide for you to take a picture as well. So um, don't worry about not, uh, noting them down right now. Right, I'm going to hand over to Chris for a demo. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so in this demo, what we're going to do is we're going to create an NSG, and we're going to allow two uh, rules through. Uh, one will be for RDP, and one will be for SQL Server, as it's for DBAs. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the top and just search NSG and press Network Security Groups. We're then going to press Create. Select your appropriate subscription and resource group, or create one if you don't have one. Give it an appropriate name and region, and then you're going to press Review and Create. Azure will then go away and think about it for a bit, and once it's done that and done the validation, we'll then get the resource. So we'll go to that. We're then going to go to the inbound security rules. So you'll notice there's already some default rules on there. You can't remove these. They are there to stay. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to go to Add at the top. And on this one, we're going to allow SQL Server on 1433. No, we're not. We're going to allow RDP, sorry, for my IP address so that you can get onto that network and you can manage it. We're going to press Create, and then we're going to you'll notice that your rule has a lower number but a higher priority than the previous existing rules. Now we're going to add <laughs> a rule for SQL Server. So on this one, what we're going to do is we're going to use what's called a service tag. We're going to allow the internet service tag, which we do not recommend, but I'll come on to that in a minute, and on port 1433. You'll notice once that's created, that you get this little yellow triangle. That's Azure telling you this is bad. Do not do it. Because we don't want to allow everyone into our SQL Server. That's definitely how you end up with a data breach. Cool. And with that, I'll pass back over to Mark. Thanks, Chris. So a bit about subnetting, everybody's favorite topic. Or maybe it's just me, because I'm a network guy. Um, <laughs> so we have, we have the concept of private IP addresses and public IP addresses. Um, Essentially, what we've got here is if it's a private IP address, the traffic will stay within your network because those IP addresses do not exist on the internet. Uh, likewise, if it's not a private IP address, then that traffic needs to find a way out of your network and, and go to the internet. There are a couple of others, but um, we don't need to worry about what those IP addresses are at the moment, just to keep this simple. <coughs> so. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, a virtual network has to contain at least one subnet for our resources to be connected to and have a connection to that virtual network. Um, and why could we have multiple subnets? It could be to logically separate our resources, or if we want to create some kind of security boundary be between them, but still allow certain traffic through. So let's say, for example, uh, we've got an app subnet, this could be for our web servers, and a database subnet for our SQL servers. And we could put a network security group in those subnets to essentially say, you know, the web servers can talk to SQL on port 1433, but nothing else, for example. <clears throat> so 
This might look familiar. This is an IPv4 address. It's a private IPv4 address. And in this case, it's 10.0.0.1. So we've got this thing in networking called side annotation, uh, which is classless interdomain routing. But we don't need to worry about what it stands for. What you need to know is what these different slash numbers are. You might have seen these before in Azure and wondered what they are. So each number is what we call an octet. The reason they're called an octet is because there's eight bits that make up uh, that particular number. So uh, if it's slash eight, that means we're locking in the first eight bits, which is the first octet. So if we have a slash eight IP address, that means that it has to start with 10, but the other three numbers could be anything between 0 and 255. That gives us approximately 16.7 million addresses. Should be plenty enough for any organization to, uh, to use, <clears throat> hopefully. If we lock in the first two, it's now a slash 16. So now the address could be 10.0. something. something. If it's slash 24, and this is probably the most common one that you'll see, the first three octets are locked in. So 10.0.0. and then the last number can be something between 0 and 255. If it's slash 32, it means that whole IP address is fixed. Um, so if we talk about NSGs and you want to allow a specific IP address through, um, you would put the IP address in slash 32 to say only that IP address. Conversely, there is a slash 0, which is anything. So you can put 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 slash anything, so to say block everything or allow everything. So that's all well and good, but it looks really complicated. So I've come up with a bit of an analogy for you. Let's uh, talk about chocolate, because everybody likes chocolate, don't we? So we've got a whole bar of lovely SQL Bits branded chocolate here. And this is one whole bar, which we could represent as one over one, or one slash one. You might see where I'm going with this. If you have half a bar, we could call that one slash two. Now, if we bring this back to subnetting, so slash 24 address, we know the first three octets have to stay the same, so 10.0.0. something between 0 and 255. So that's a slash 24 address. Now, if we half that, we would have a slash 25, which is the equivalent of taking our bar of chocolate and nicely snapping it in half. <laughs> and like a bar of chocolate, um, the two halves have to meet up and go back together if you try and make it whole again. Um, however you would do that, glue or try and melt it back together. But subnetting is like that too. So the first half of the subnet has to um, be uh, 10.00 slash 25, which would give you addresses between 0 and 127. Likewise, if you want the second half, it would be 10.00 uh, slash 25, which will give you any address between 128 and 255. So as we break up the chocolate more and more, we can see that the denominator increases. And with subnetting, it's the same. Every time we have to subnet, the denominator increases by 1. So 25 gives you half the addresses of 24. 26 is half of 25. 27 is half of 26. Now, the reason we've only gone as far as 27 is because, um, for most cases, that's the Azure recommended uh, minimum uh, address size in Azure. So to bring this all back together, we're going to pass back to Chris so we can demo how to create the network. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a VNet with two subnets, and we're going to attach the NSG we created earlier to one of those subnets. So again, in the Azure portal, we'll go to Virtual Networks on the left-hand side, or search at the top, and press Create. You'll then select an appropriate subscription and resource group, give it a virtual network a name. Uh, this will be unique within the resource group. We then go to Next. There is a whole bunch of security rules here that you can configure, but for fundamentals, we're not going to talk about these today. We'll then go to IP address. So in here, you'll see that your total IVP4 address rate space is the available that you can use. There are a new thing that's just appeared is the subnet templates, um, which you can either configure yourself or use any existing ones in Azure, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
give it an appropriate name and we're going to select slash 24. Note this does say that gives you 256 addresses, which is a slight lie, but we'll talk about that in a second. We're then going to go review and create, and Azure again goes away, does some validation, and then deploys it. So we'll go to the resource. We're going to go over to subnets and attach the subnet we created earlier to my subnet. So press my subnet and select the NSG we created earlier, and then press Save. What you'll notice is that here it says available IPs 251. That's because Azure cre keeps the first four and the last one for internal uh, routing and networking. We'll go into more detail about that in another session if people are interested or afterwards. And I think it's frozen, but I'll pass back to Mike, Mark. <laughs> oh, there we ah, go. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, so that's the end of our session. Uh, feel free to take a picture of this, uh, this cheat sheet. This will help you uh, when you need to create uh, networks in Azure. Um, we're going to hang around. If anybody's got any questions, if you'd like any chocolate, please come up and help yourself. But thank you very much. <laughs>